Hello, uh, my name is John McQuillan. I'm a senior editor at the Harvard Kennedy School Student Policy Review. And today we have the pleasure of having Dr. Karen Donfried. Uh, Dr. Karen Donfried recently served as the Assistant Secretary of State of Europe and Eurasia Affairs uh, from 2021 to 2023 after a long uh, career in diplomacy and international affairs. And now she is at the Harvard uh, Belfer Center uh, as a fellow, a senior fellow, and uh, had been running a study group, among other things, on the Ukraine conflict. And I had the pleasure of being a part of that uh, study group in the fall and spring semester. So just happy to, to have Dr. Donfried here today. Uh, thank well, you it's very. such a pleasure to be with you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just get, to get started, just to talk about the Ukraine war, uh, kind of recently you published a foreign affairs article talking about the upcoming summit this summer in DC on, on NATO. Um, and a conversation is, should Ukraine be admitted into NATO? And so you have some allies, uh, for France, for example, who suggested that we should look at ways to, to um, accept NATO. Other countries, like the United States and Germany, have some reluctance, kind of worrying this could lead to a lar larger conflict. Um, just what's your perspective on NATO? Do you think, kind of, what do you think is going to happen to this, this summit um, uh, this, this summer? Well, thanks so much for that question. And it ties into both the war that is taking place tragically in Ukraine today, but it also connects to the larger question of once that war ends, what is Ukraine's place in the European security order? And so what my friend and colleague, Ivo Dalder and I argued in that foreign affairs article is, first priority is ending the war. And we start by saying Ukraine is bleeding and there is an urgent need for the U.S. House of Representatives to pass the supplemental appropriations bill that contains additional assistance for Ukraine. And I would repeat that that is still the priority today. This bill has been held up for months and the Ukrainians are suffering on the battlefield for it. So there's one conversation about the war and how that war ends. I think it is very much in the interest of the United States of America that Ukraine win this war. Obviously for Ukraine it's existential. It has significant implications for European security. Ukraine is bordered on the West by NATO allies, and the United States has a treaty commitment to those allies. It also matters for global stability. Because if the U.S. says, we believe in the principles embodied in the Charter of the United Nations, the rules that govern the world we live in, that say we should respect another country's sovereignty, we should respect their territorial integrity, might does not make right. And this is a case where Russia, a big country with one of the most feared militaries in the world, invaded its smaller, weaker neighbor for no reason. And if we let that stand, then we are turning our backs on this rules-based order. So there's that piece. But then Evo and I argue, we also need to think forward about once this war is over, what happens? And that's where you get to the debate about NATO membership. Mm -hmm. And you're right, within the NATO alliance, different members have different views. So you have the Baltic countries, Poland, France, arguing NATO should offer Ukraine membership at the July summit in Washington, 75th anniversary summit. The US and Germany are worried about that because they say, gosh, if we admit a country where there's active fighting, there's a pretty good chance NATO will be pulled into that war. And President Biden has been clear that he does not want a war between the US and Russia. He thinks that's not in anyone's interest. So we've been at this impasse. And we were trying to build a bridge to NATO membership for Ukraine with some very concrete ideas, which we certainly can explore. But that was the purpose of the article, because we believe that if you don't think about how to secure Ukraine's future, you might have a war five years from now, eight years from now, again, with Russia invading Ukraine. So we need to ensure Ukraine can defend itself by having an army that has real defensive power, sort of porcupining Ukraine, 
and also bring Ukraine into NATO, the European security institution that has been here since the end of World War II. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for, for that answer. And, and, and just, I mean, on touching on NATO, I mean, we've had, uh, you know, in response to the Russia, Russian invasion to, of Ukraine, you've had Finland and Sweden join, which has been a huge kind of, um, I mean, Sweden historically kind of trying to, you know, be diplomatic and, and kind of and bridge that ground, but it's joined, and so you have two countries joining NATO. Um, you kind of talked a little bit about some disagreements about admitting Ukraine at the summit. I mean, is Europe more unified today following the Ukraine war, uh, the, the invasion of, of Ukraine by Russia? Is it, is it more unified today, kind of pointing to those NATO memberships of Sweden and Finland? Um, what, what's your perspective on that? It's such an important question, because when we think about the time we're living in. I'm someone who does believe that we are in a new era of great power competition. And when we think about the powers that dominate our world, you know, if you said, give me the top three, probably most people would say the United States, China, and Russia. And those three countries are all involved in what's playing out in Ukraine. And Having war erupt on the European continent was a wake-up call for every one of our European allies. The Baltic countries, Poland, others in Central and Eastern Europe were not surprised. They have long believed Russia is an aggressive power and it was just a matter of time. I think many of our allies in Western Europe were genuinely surprised. Even though they saw the intelligence that we shared with them, their assessment was, no, at the end of the day, Vladimir Putin believes Russia has more to gain by cooperating with us and by engaging in open conflict. Well, everybody got their answer on right. February 24, 2022. And of course, that was a deeply tragic answer for Ukraine. But it reminded everyone why the transatlantic relationship why that alliance is so powerful. And what sets the U.S. apart from China and Russia is precisely the fact that we have allies around the world. Whether those are allies in Europe, whether it's Japan and South Korea, we just had the visit of the Japanese Prime Minister to Washington, we could go on and on. Yeah. So there's something uniquely valuable about the alliance relationships the United States has. And I do think it has been deeply strengthened between the US and Europe over the past two and a half years. Now, you know, when you ask about Finland and Sweden, I did not think in my lifetime I would see those two countries right. join NATO. Yeah. They have long believed it's better for us to be non-aligned, and frankly, it may be better for you. And when Putin undertook that full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the president of Finland, President Ninisto, said, it's, I'm done. I am going to apply for NATO membership because deterrence failed. That was his number one lesson. Deterrence failed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And we, Finland, are extremely exposed to Russia, the Finns have an 850, more than that, mile border with Russia. I think Sweden didn't have that overnight recognition, but because Sweden and Finland have so integrated their defense structures, Sweden felt, well, if Finland's going, right. we need to go. And those two countries are now full members of the NATO alliance. And I think about Vladimir Putin, and we can talk about why he invaded Ukraine, but he has said, NATO was getting too close to my borders, I had to act. Right. I don't actually think that was the fundamental reason he invaded, but yeah. he has said this publicly. It has already been a strategic failure for Vladimir Putin that Finland and Sweden join NATO. Because with Finland, he really has a NATO member that is on his border. Yeah. So it's quite stunning the strategic realignment you've seen in Europe as a result of that fateful decision that Putin made. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. That's, and that's a really good perspective. And, and I, I mean, on the kind of U.S.'s engagement with Ukraine, um, the billions have gone to military assistance. We're kind of stalled in the Senate right now about if more aid should be given. I mean, if you had to 
kind of predict, which of course predictions in this, in this realm have been difficult to, to be accurate. I mean, do you see more emergency aid going through Congress uh, before this presidential election uh, to kind of to help Ukraine fight this conflict? You are right to emphasize the outsized role the United States has played, is playing in providing military assistance to Ukraine. It's important to acknowledge that. It's also important to acknowledge that many of the weapons we are sending are produced in the United States. Right. So there is a benefit to the US economy of this, which is not why President Biden made that decision. President Biden felt, simply put, it was wrong. <laughs> it was wrong that the bigger, stronger country invades its weaker neighbor, takes its sovereign territory, and wants to call it a day. And again, he felt that the United States, as the major democracy in the global system, needed to stand up for what it believed in. And I think some lessons were learned from what happened in Ukraine in 2014, where Russia illegally annexed Crimea, sent some of its folks to occupy parts of the Donbass in southeastern Ukraine. And there was a sense that, oh, he's not going to stop unless we stop him. The Europeans have played a very important role also in providing assistance of all kinds to Ukraine. So if we say the United States is leading the pack with, and these numbers are different, I've, I've seen a, a German institute that has done a very good job of tracking aid that has the numbers as the U.S. providing about 44 billion euros in military assistance. Surprisingly, the second largest provider is Germany right. with about 17 billion euros of assistance. And we know the U.K. also has been uh, in that league. They're in the third position, but it's quite impressive collectively what the Europeans are doing, and particularly for a country like Germany, that until three days after Putin's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, had had a policy of not providing weapons to a conflict zone because of German history, they overturned that policy. And as I just mentioned, they're now the second largest provider. So I think in terms of a burden sharing perspective, the Europeans are doing a lot. Uh, and I should point out, they're doing more than we are in terms of economic support for Ukraine, mm -hmm. which is also vital to Ukraine. Because if the country goes bankrupt, yeah. they're going to lose the war too. So just a point about, yes, our role on providing military assistance, very important. But let's not ignore the critical and significant role the Europeans and other allies are playing. So when we get to the current situation, where the administration last fall had put a supplemental appropriations request to Congress that included funding for Ukraine, for Israel, for the Indo-Pacific, Taiwan. Um, the amount of funding for Ukraine in that bill was much larger than the other countries. It was about $61 billion for Ukraine. And the majority of that 61 billion is military assistance. And that bill has stalled. Right. The Senate passed it by a vote of 70 in favor, 29 against in February. It went to the House and Speaker Johnson said, sorry, I'm not gonna send it to the floor. Knowing that if he let that bill go to the floor of the House, it would pass. Because there is a majority in the House in support Things have gotten more complicated. Right. Uh, President, uh, former President Trump has not supported the bill. Then there have been various ideas of, well, could we massage some of these provisions? There was an idea about maybe the funding that isn't going to military assistance could be made a loan. The loan could have no interest, it could be forgivable, but maybe that would be a construct. Speaker Johnson uh, said, well, I'm gonna put a bill to the floor of the House when we come back from Easter recess, which would be now. Right. Um, but it's gonna look different than the Senate bill because I'm gonna have a provision, the Repo Act, which is about seizing frozen Russian assets. I'm gonna put in this loan provision that I mentioned. And also, we're gonna say the administration has to lift its ban on LNG. 
But he hasn't done that yet. We don't really know what the bill will look like that he'll send to the House floor or if he will send a bill to the House floor. Uh, we know that today he is having a meeting with former President Trump and they will have a joint press conference. We will learn more then. But I cannot tell you how painful it is to watch this as someone who thinks it is in the interest of the U.S. to provide this assistance to Ukraine right. and who sees what is happening on the battlefield. And that's why the first three words of the article you referenced in Foreign Affairs are, Ukraine is bleeding, period. Yeah, Th thank you very much. I, I think on this subject of, I mean, uh, on aid and, and kind of actions that, that countries can take. One of the, one of the has been, uh, policies has been suggested that we currently have 300 billion of Russian, um, Russian assets and, and Western banks. Uh, and it's been, they've been frozen since the start of the, uh, since start of the war. Um, but there's an ongoing policy debate uh, if that, those assets should be um, taken and used to fund, uh, seized and taken and used to fund Ukraine and, and, and fund the, the war effort. Um, and it has historically not been done before, so there's kind of a worry about precedent. I mean, what's your perspective on this debate? Is, is this something that we should do? Um, are there concerns there? Is, or kind of where do you think this debate is going? There is a very active debate about this question. And what we're talking about here are Russian sovereign assets. So these are assets that were in Russia's central bank that Russia decided to invest outside of Russia. So some of those assets are invested in the United States, but that's a minority of the 300 billion. Most of those assets are actually in Europe. So part of this is a question for the US government, and is the US government comfortable seizing those frozen Russian sovereign assets that we have access to in US dollars, but also to have real impact, we would need to cooperate with our allies and have a consolidated approach to this. Right. Now, in the US, as someone who comes at this from the foreign policy side, seems like a great idea to me. <laughs> you know, Russia has illegally invaded its weaker neighbor without provocation. It just seems like such a clear case of right and wrong. It seems to me justified that one would say, well, there's a price to pay for that. And you extract that price in different ways, but seizing frozen sovereign assets seems to make sense. Now, you know, colleagues at the Treasury Department have other concerns. They worry about the role the US dollar plays in the international financial system. Lots of other countries have their currencies invested here. Are we going to set a precedent that ultimately undermines US interests. And again, my sense as someone who is not an expert on economic and finance is, well, but if you write this in a way that says, if a country invades its weaker neighbor without provocation, and you know, we've had multiple UN General Assembly resolutions condemning Russia's action. You could have a basis in international law for that. That under these circumstances, it is appropriate to seize frozen sovereign assets. So it seems to me that you could define it in a way that is appropriate. And if the US were to invade Canada without provocation, or you know, then yes, it should be applied to the United States as well. Mm -hmm. Though in fairness, I should point out, the US does not tend to <laughs> have its assets in other countries. Right. But um, it is a very live debate right now. There are smart people arguing each side of this. And I think there is a real effort to work in the G7 to build an international consensus around how this particular issue should be adjudicated. But I do think it is appropriate that people are giving it this serious consideration. And my, my hope is that the outcome of this would be an international consensus that in this case, it is in fact appropriate. Thank you. And, and on the subject of, of aid, I mean, uh, I, ideally any aid we can, can pass through is, is, is better than none. Um, but just from a perspective of, there's been a kind of a debate about 
Should we be giving uh, high Mars, like the, the, the advanced artillery? Should we be giving uh, more like air power, F F-15? Should we be more, more armored vehicles, kind of more bolstered advanced technology to help win the war effort? Or should we focus more on conventional arms and ammunition? Mm -hmm. I mean, what's your perspective? If we have to prioritize aid, what's more, most mm -hmm. necessary for, for Ukraine to be successful in the war? So right now, what Ukraine needs most would be ammunition, artillery shells, air defense munitions. So we're seeing the Russians pommel Ukraine's energy and electricity grid. And we have Patriot's other air defense systems around key energy nodes, around cities, but they're running out of munitions. And on the battlefield, we're seeing the Ukrainians having to think three times before they fire because they have limited ammunition and artillery. So those are urgent needs. I don't have a problem with sending Ukraine the other weapon systems, including long-range missiles. But I think the urgent need is this other category of weaponry. And we talked earlier about the NATO summit in July. And General Cavoli, who is the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, just testified earlier this week in front of the House Armed Services Committee. And he said, in crystal clear terms, the side that can't shoot back loses. And he was ringing an alarm bell about the state of the battlefield right now. And before we even think about these larger issues of securing Ukraine's future in NATO, mm -hmm. we have to have our eyes wide open that if we don't get this assistance to Ukraine immediately, mm -hmm. the offensive the Russians are planning for this summer is very likely to be breaking through a front line that hasn't really moved much for a year. But the, the breakthroughs we started to see in places like Avdivka, we could see that multiplied and have a Ukraine that really looks like it is losing this war come July. So I just cannot overstate the stakes of what is happening right now. And I just hope that we collectively, our political leadership on both sides of the aisle and the American people understand those stakes and are ready to live out the words of President Biden when he said, we will stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Yeah, that, thank you very much. And I think just for our final question and kind of touching on what, what, you're, what you're saying, I mean, when the initial invasion was happening, I think a lot of predictions were it's Ukraine's going to fall quickly, it's going to be a very brief war, and, 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 and that Russia will be successful. They beat back, up, back all expectations, um, ma mass mm -hmm. and massive, a successful counteroffensive was very, um, like using a lot of different tactics and experimenting and kind of being really impressed the world. Uh, and got a lot of public support. And now we've gotten to a part where it's more politically divisive. There's, there's this concern about continuing aid to Ukraine, um, especially among conservatives uh, right now. And so I guess for this framing, I mean, how should the Biden administration and, and, and NATO allies be talking about this war? Because it, it's probably not going to end in the next couple of months. It, it, like you're mentioning, it, there's a duration of this. So how long do you think this conflict realistically could occur? And, and should that be reflected in kind of the messaging that the Biden administration and NATO allies are talking about to this kind of, is it a long-term commitment that will take years and years? Uh, kind of your perspective on that. Predictions, obviously, not easy mm -hmm. to make, but just kind of what do you, where do you see the direction going right now? You're so right about the expectations at the beginning of the war. and. I think Americans were moved by watching the bravery and the resilience of the Ukrainians in standing up to this much bigger military of a former superpower. And that was quite inspiring, I think, to people around the world. And we have to remember that defense is also easier than offense. And so the challenge for the Ukrainians that we saw this last year when they undertook the counteroffensive, 
that it was very difficult for them to break through the Russian defensive lines. Because the Russians had spent many months building those defensive lines. So the Ukrainian ability to take back territory occupied by Russia was really challenging. So you have a Russia today that's still occupying about 18 to 20 percent of Ukraine. So that's why you've seen this it's not, I'm not sure stalemate is the right word, but it's why you've seen the front line be pretty solid and not move very much. It's moved bits here and there right. over the past year. And this question about sort of when the war ends and how it ends is difficult to answer. Yeah. As we saw in the initial days, most analysts got it wrong. It turned right. out Ukraine had much greater staying power. And they also have morale on their side. They're fighting for the very existence of their country. Yeah. And so when we think about this today, you know, we hear some members of Congress say, gosh, you know, look, we can't really help Ukraine win this war. That's the reality. We should cut our losses. Mm -hmm. We have to understand what American interests are here and what Ukrainian interests are. It's not that we're just doing this for Ukraine. Yes, of course, we want Ukraine to end, win this war and that helps Ukraine, right. but we have to understand that defending the right of a sovereign country, A, to exist, B, to decide its own foreign and security policy, C, to maintain control of its sovereign territory, those are broader principles that we believe in. And the world that we live in, and we are the greatest power in this world, we need to stand up for the principle that might does not make right. Because I can assure you, the Chinese are watching like a hawk how this is playing out in Ukraine and thinking about what lessons they can learn for a future possible contingency against Taiwan or other potential conflicts in Asia. The Iranians are watching this. The implications of this are global. So we need to understand that. We also need to understand that right now, Vladimir Putin is feeling pretty good because he's thinking, I was right. I care about this more than the Americans do and I have greater staying power than those democracies. And we, as the United States of America, have the ability to prove him wrong. And I hope we do. Yeah, uh, with that, thank you so much, Dr. Donfried. Uh, amazing uh, interview. Thank you for your time and, and your efforts uh, as a Belfer Fellow and, and in your time serving our country. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone for watching. Uh, please continue to read the Harvard Kennedy School Student Policy Review.